Good evening. I'm Liz Murphy, the forum producer here at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. On behalf of all of my library and foundation colleagues, thank you for coming this evening. And for those of you watching on webcast, welcome to you as well. I would like to acknowledge the, gen the generous support of our underwriters at the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsor Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. After tonight's conversation and question and answer period, Dr. Farah, whose work we're honored to feature tonight, will be signing copies of his new book in the lobby right outside the doors, and our bookstore does have copies available for sale if you're interested. It is a tremendous pleasure to introduce Dr. Farah this evening. Uh, Dr. Andrew Farah is the author, as you know, of Hemingway's Brain. He serves as the Chief of Psychiatry at the High Point Division of the University of North Carolina Healthcare System. He is a native of Charleston, South Carolina, and a graduate of Clemson University and the Medical University of South Carolina. He completed his residency at Wake Forest University, and in 2014, he was named a Distinguished Fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. Andy, on behalf of everybody at the Library and Foundation, welcome. Thank you for making the trip up north to discuss your work with us, and, and we're so excited to have you here. Thank you. It's also my privilege to introduce this evening's interlocutor and moderator, Dr. Linda Patterson Miller. She is Distinguished Professor of English at Penn State Abington, where she has taught American literature since 1984. She is the author of the forthcoming book, Reading Hemingway in Our Time, as well as The Book of American Diaries, and Letters from the Lost Generation, Gerald and Sarah Murphy and Friends, as well as numerous scholarly articles. She's presently completing another book on the American expatriate artists in France. She is a longtime board member of the Ernest Hemingway Foundation, and she chairs the editorial advisory board for the Cambridge edition of the Letters of Ernest Hemingway. Linda, thank you so much for agreeing to moderate tonight's forum. We're really looking forward to the conversation. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's a delight to be here. I'm always thrilled to talk about Hemingway. Um, I guess as a woman, it's not popular to say um, that I'm in love with Papa, but it's been a long career where um, increasingly Hemingway has taken over my own scholarship. Um, I'm always thrilled to see new works that come out, and um, works keep coming out endlessly. There's no end of fascination with Hemingway, and it's a thrill for me to be here today to be with Andrew, Andrew Farah and um, to discuss his wonderful new book on Hemingway's brain. Um, Ernest Hemingway, as we know, is a complicated man and an even more complex writer. No wonder that people remained endlessly fascinated with his life and his art. He was designated early on as the father of modern American prose, and he became an overnight sensation and an iconic figure in American life. Recognized for his innovative prose, what Ezra Pound would call the shock of the new, he was also known by the persona that would both define and then entrap him. Scholars have long deliberated over Hemingway's personal complexities and his mental demons that led to increasingly erratic and even abusive behavior. And they have puzzled over the nuances of, of his writing as his style began to shift and change over time. Hemingway knew from a young age that he wanted to write. And when he began to recognize that his memory would fail him, he became morose and even suicidal. If he could no longer write, he told A.E. Hotchner, he no longer wanted to live. Scholars and many an armchair psychologist have speculated about Hemingway's mental state only to arrive at a variety of conclusions, many of them now suspect. Fortunately, we now have a legitimate and first-rate psychiatrist here with Andrew Farah, who has taken on Hemingway and dared to diagnose, in definitive terms, the intricate workings of his brain. Andrew Farah draws convincingly upon the latest scientific studies to help us appreciate the multiple factors that culminated in Hemingway's suicide in the summer of 1961. 
Andrew and I uh, serendipitously met in New Orleans a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think it was divinely inspired that we were both there at the same time, and we had a wonderful time um, talking about Hemingway and went on for a couple of hours and could have gone longer, so stand forewarned. Um, right, right. <laughs> so I'm going to be just kind of feeding some questions to Andrew and allow him to really move forward and talk about his incredible book. Um, I asked Andrew when I first met him, I was intrigued by this. Here we've got a, a psychiatrist. Uh, he's not a typical Hemingway scholar in terms of a literary scholar in the academic world. And here's the psychiatrist who's, who's taken on the study of, of Hemingway. And I asked him, first thing, what led you to this study yeah. right. of Hemingway? Let's, thank you for that lovely introduction. We were in New Orleans, and um, we were both there for different meetings. But I was, we were having such a good time, I was ignoring my cell phone going off. And by the time I picked it up, I was 10 minutes late for my own lecture, so I, we had talked so long. Oh, so was I, that a lecture you were giving well, me late for? Well, I didn't sort of. share that already. But yeah. <laughs> so, I, so I ran out and left her with the bill, but I made it. <laughs> but yes, you know, um, uh, you know I, of course, was a fan of um, the fictional works for a long time. And, and I remember being in middle school, being assigned uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls, and thinking it was just beyond me, and, and I remember going to my father and saying, can you explain to me the Spanish Civil War, which is like my little boy coming to me now and saying, what's going on in Syria? I'm like, I, I don't know how to explain that. Um, so I, I actually put him aside and, and focused on Joyce. Can you imagine that, finding Joyce simpler than Hemingway? Um, but um, years later, I, right out of residency, I met with a, a nice gentleman named William Smallwood. He had helped Tilly Arnold write her memoirs of Hemingway, the Idaho Hemingway. And he was passing through the triad, and he knew of me through, as a resident, I did research on ECT, you know, shock therapy, what Hemingway received. And he wanted to meet someone who knew about shock therapy, and he had a, a, two questions. Uh, he said, why did Hemingway decline and deteriorate after his shock therapy and, and commit suicide? He had always read that 90% of people get a cure. And, and he said, and, and secondly, what would you do for him today? And I said, well, the patients that we treat with uh, electroconvulsive therapy, convulsive therapy, who decline, what we learned from that decline is that they had some undiagnosed organic brain disease that we had yet to see prior, to, that the treatment was the biological stressor that allowed it to manifest. Um, and he said, well, what was that for Hemingway? And I said, I, I don't know. Let me read your book. And I started reading all of the biographies. And as you know, it's quite addicting. Uh, the biographies are just fascinating from, at so many levels. Um, and that's when I came to the conclusion. I was kind of amazed that uh, no one had put the dots together before. Um, you know, we'd always, uh, I think that people had repeated the myths so often that he was bipolar or that alcohol explained everything. And it was just too easy to repeat the myths and, and not do the, the, the tough work. So what, what is your diagnosis? Well, <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, you know, let's, let's, yes, he had dementia, but a specific kind of dementia. It was predominantly chronic traumatic encephalopathy, like we read about with football players or boxers. Now, this was not unknown uh, at the time because people had described dementia pugilistica, which is what boxers get. And he had written beautifully in The Battler, right, Ad Francis, who was a, a boxer modeled on two other boxers, Ad Wolgast, I think, and Oscar Nelson, who were known for their ring-induced trauma, chronic trauma. Uh, however, um, medical science had not caught up with Hemingway, even as in 1961, when Hemingway himself was being treated, uh, the current thinking about post-concussive syndrome was that it was a form of neuroses, that it was um, psychogenic. It was not an organic illness. In fact, the pivotal article was titled Accident Neuroses, saying these people in car wrecks claim that they have these concussive injuries. They're just looking for attention or something. But Hemingway himself suffered at least nine major concussions during his life. Um, now, he boxed throughout his young life. Uh, he played football in high school, and he described uh, that a, a little bit in his writing. But the first major concussion was, of course, in World War I, uh, the five-gallon Austrian mortar. He's up in northern Veneto. Uh, this mortar uh, explodes and throws him several feet, buries him in earth, kills a man between him and the bomb, blows the legs off, and kills another man. 
Um, he lays unconscious for a while. But what's important about that is that it was a wave blast injury. So there's, there's two ways, multiple ways you can get a concussion, but we divide them in, in terms of that energy wave of a blast and the direct blow. And his first major one was, was that energy wave. We know that 20% of returning veterans from Afghanistan and Iraq suffer those types of injuries, you know? And it's estimated that 2% of the population lives with some type of chronic disability from a head injury. So this is not unknown science at the time, it was fairly unknown. But that was the first major concussion and a very important one. And of course, it had multiple effects for his life and for his writing career and so forth and his persona. But then we zoom ahead to the Paris years. He's with Pauline, right, second wife, I think 1928. Comes home after drinking all night with Archie McLeish, right? He goes in the bathroom at 2 in the morning and he goes to flush the commode and grabs the wrong cord and he's the cords have gotten mixed up, so he pulls the chain or the cord on the skylight, pulls the skylight onto his head, right, gives himself another uh, major concussion, and you, you see that famous horseshoe-shaped scar over the left frontal area. So now we um, fast forward, um, goodness, um, where, to, where to stop with the next concussion? Um, the, during the Blitz in London, it was blacked out, and he's partying with Robert Capa, right, the famous photographer. They were buddies, of course, in the Spanish Civil War and World War II. Uh, Kappa was celebrating his girlfriend's birthday, her name was Pinky, and they were partying into the night, but Hemingway is in the passenger seat of a car. The driver was chosen to drive because he was described as, quote, no drunker than Hemingway, right? <laughs> so can you imagine being at a party where you're no drunker than I am, so you get to drive, you know? Well, of course, it's blacked out during the Blitz, and they plow into this water tower at Leicester Square, and of course Hemingway goes into the windshield, requires 57 stitches again in the frontal area. Now he's supposed to cover Normandy, right, the D-Day landing. He's finding after this concussion it's very difficult to climb in and out of the boat, the Higgins craft, and so forth. During World War II he's sort of running around uh, getting into trouble. He's with Robert Kappa again. Hemingway's in the sidecar of a motorbike, and they come around, they, they're really on an ill-advised mission, they come around a corner, and they run into some Germans and an anti-tank round blows up. 10 feet from Hemingway is what Kappa said. Hemingway thought it was three feet, who knows. It blew him off the, out of the sidecar and he hit his head on a boulder. So now in that instant we have the wave blast injury and the direct blow injury, okay. Now within a, a few months we're in, we're in Cuba, he falls off his fishing boat, that famous incident, and this is the funny one where he, the ga I guess it's the gaff or whatever holds the, you know, the clamps on the edge of the ship, uh, hit his uh, head and, and busted it down to the skull, and the surgeon said, being thick-skulled saved your life, and he says that's a form of literary criticism, calling me thick-skulled, right? So at any rate, um, gets sewn up there. But of course now, after the two plane crashes in Africa, this is the, the famous stories where they're on the 1954 safari, and Mary is um, wanting to photograph uh, Murchison Falls, uh, and a flock of ibis cuts in front of the aircraft, so they, they dodge, they hit some telegraph wires, the, the, the plane crashes. But it wasn't that serious a crash, but of course this is when the commercial airliner spots it, radios back that there are no survivors, and they begin writing his obituaries, which he was fascinated with, and he would stay up at night reading his own obituaries, and Heming, uh, Mary Hemingway would say, turn out the light, go to bed, you can't read your obituaries all night, right? So he, um, but th there's a plane looking for them, it finds them, a twin engine de Havilland, and unfortunately, um, it landed in what was not so much a runway, but a badly plowed field. And so the um, pilot taking off crashes on takeoff, right? So uh, this crash is more fiery, more violent. Uh, the pilot kicks out the front window, the cockpit's filling with smoke, he climbs out, his name was Cartwright, Roger Cartwright, he pulls Mary out, but Hemingway's too big to get out the window, the door is jammed, he's injured his shoulder from the other crash, so he chooses very unwisely to bust open the door with his head, giving himself a, a skull fracture and another concussion. So it was after the second plane crash where his, his, his cognition was not the same, his, his memory was worse, his headaches were persistent. Uh, at, at that point, the post-concussive syndrome had, had taken hold. Uh, and in his own letters, I was just, before coming up here, I remember just thumbing through the collected letters, or selected letters rather, and I put a little sticky note every time he himself used the word concussion in a letter or described post-concussive symptoms. It was just like about seven, you know, in there. So he himself knew what was going on. Uh, so that's really the diagnosis, that we have a man who had multiple head injuries, and he had a form of dementia that was predominantly from concussive injury. 
But there were other contributors, which of course would be heavy drinking and would also probably have a vascular component. Um, he had untreated diabetes and pre-diabetes to diabetes and untreated hypertension for most of his adult life, or actually past 1940. And that would put you at risk for very small strokes in the brain, not enough to make your arm paralyzed, but enough to do cumulative damage. And we call that vascular type dementia. The reason I throw that in is because the risk factors were there, but also the specific kinds of delusions he had later in life seemed to, to indicate a vascular. That's just sort of what I see with patients with vascular dementia. So really it's more the accumulative effect of these incredibly right. numerous concussions that Absolutely. he suffered. Absolutely. Now, not everyone who has a concussion has post-concussive syndrome, uh -huh. but about 20% of people have persistent deficits that just can last a lifetime. And the importance that I, as I emphasize the blast injury, because after the wave energy type concussion, you can have chronic traumatic encephalopathy with just one of those injuries, whereas it usually takes multiple blows to develop, but it is a cumulative type damage. There's also evidence that you can have multiple sub-concussive blows, uh, like the boxer who never has the concussion but has multiple sub-concussive blows that can have the same effect. So again, it's, a, it's an accumulation of damage. It's interesting. <clears throat> um, scholars have made such a big deal over Hemingway's war wounding. Right. Um, right. Maybe excessively so mm -hmm. um, in a tribute you know, all of Hemingway's portrayals of wounded warriors as psychologically um, depressed characters. Um, and they attribute it, it began with Philip Young. Oh, right, uh, the trauma artist, With right. his book, Hemingway Reconsideration. And um, do you think that had Hemingway just had that one entry in war, right. that it would have led to what we see you know, it's, it's, it's probably not to the degree, right? It probably would not have reached the threshold of such a, a, of a decline that we would write this book, right? But, it, but it, it would have changed his life because I think that the concussive blow was that serious. I think when we were earlier speaking, I, I remember a phrase, I, think, I don't know if it was your phrase or mine, but I think he got all of the war trauma he could have hoped for, but more than he bargained for. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So he comes back with this great war story, the wounds, the crutches, the really cool cape, you know, and he's the hero. Um, but the, the seeds of the, the damage were already planted, sort of like a time bomb. And of course, there was the psychological impact. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, because I think yeah. in talking about this war wound, mm -hmm. um, scholars have tended to focus on the uh, leg injuries, the shrapnel right. that you know, seriously right. damaged his legs, and he almost lost one leg um, right. as a consequence. And I don't recall anyone really talking about the head wound, and so right. that's very interesting to me, and it, right. that caused me to go back right. and look into Farewell to Arms, where Hemingway writes, of course, 10 years later about his war experience. And um, I noticed, I'm gonna just read a yes. little passage from here yes. that describes Hemingway's war wound right. through the framework of Frederick Henry, mm -hmm. and I noticed that it culminates in a kind of very direct description that he was indeed hit by you know his head was and that was maybe a right. more major um, factor right. in his wounding than the other. But right. um, I'm sure many of you have read *A Farewell to Arms*. But here's mm -hmm. Frederick Henry um, describing his wounding. I ate. Uh, interesting that he's wounded while eating cheese. You know how mundane. Mm -hmm. um, they're discussing uh, philosophically the war and then. Um, the, the hits come. I ate the end of my piece of cheese and took a swallow of wine. Through the other noise, I heard a cough. Then came the ch 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 Then there was a flash, as when a blast furnace door swung open and a roar that started white and went red and on and on in a rushing wind. I tried to breathe, but my breath would not come. And I felt myself rush bodily out of myself and out and out and out and all the time bodily in the wind. I went out swiftly all of myself and I knew I was dead and that it had all been a mistake to think you just died. Then I floated and instead of going on, I felt myself slide back. I breathed and I was back. The ground was torn up and in front of my head, 
there was a splintered beam of wood. Mm -hmm. In the jolt of my head, I heard someone crying. I sat up straight, and as I did so, something inside my head moved like the weights on a doll's eyes, and it hit me inside, in the back of my eyeballs. I knew that I was hit. I thought that was really an incredible description of actually the, the concussion head wound. Yes. And is that yes. kind of what you see in your patients, that description of where he talks about um, not only the kind of out-of-body experience, but also something moving inside his head like the weights on a doll's eyes. And it hit, hit yeah. me behind my eye. That kind of yeah. almost detachment from yourself yeah. and the kind of you have to catch up almost to... You're, you're absolutely right. Those are common findings, this idea that um, <clears throat> there's this disconnect between your eye movements and the rest of your head. In fact, the medical term of doll eyes indicates a severe head injury where you, you know, as you turn a doll and the eyes move separately than you would expect. Um, and the out-of-body experience is, is fascinating because it shows up here. It shows up in Now I Lay Me, right? Mm -hmm. So it's something that he processed. We know that that can occur with concussive injury, but yeah. exclusively, it seems, with the, the wave-type injury. Now, it's, it's, you don't meet a lot of psychiatrists who talk so about that. Tell me again, what is the wave? Oh, of, what of is the that? energy wave of a blast, okay. rather than the direct blow of getting hit on the head, right? So okay. the, the, the concussive wave energy of an explosion versus the um, direct blow. Um, but you don't meet a lot of psychiatrists who want to talk about it because the paranormal people kind of want to encroach mm -hmm. on that. But we do, when people do report that sort of out-of-body sensation with, with head injury, we, we seem to localize it to the temporal parietal area in the right side, temporal parietal area of the brain. And that kind of makes sense because parietal area is how you keep track of space and temporal area times over. Who knows? As a neuropsychiatrist, you can point to a place in the brain where this can happen. We tend to say, put the stamp of approval on it, and we take it away from the paranormal people. <laughs> but uh, but it, 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 it informed him. You know, he, he wrote in October of that year to his family, I have seen death, and I'm not afraid, this very heroic language. Uh, he said, I've pretty much proved con conclusively that nothing can bump me off. So I think that out-of-body sort of sensation almost... Um, validated his sort of adolescent sense of daredevil invincibility that he carried with him the rest of his life. But it also um, gave him that insight of that crossing over, you mm -hmm. know, that, uh, you know, so much of, um, uh, you know, your friend um, Robert Gudgesack writes beautifully about Joyce and Hemingway, uh, both being concerned with this breaking down the dichotomy of the spirit matter world, right, and crossing over. Um, and, you know, Ulysses, for goodness sakes, goes to the underworld. Finnegan's Wake is the premise is awake. And uh, across the river and into the trees is cross, crossing, right? It's about the last 24 hours of a man's life based on the words of Stonewall Jackson on his deathbed, you know, or um, Snows of Kilimanjaro is about a slow death. Uh, so I think that it informed the literature in that way. But it also, in, it, it was something he could process. But I think it, it kind of made him feel a little special, that he was a bit invincible. You know? but, but to get back to your earlier point, you're, you're absolutely right that he was, you know, he was pretty good at uh, describing uh, bodily sensation like that, which uh, most of your patients just report being dazed and confused. But you're talking about a genius who was acutely aware and, in his own words, uh, noticed everything, and that included himself. What's well, yeah. interesting um, mm -hmm. that as he was a very young guy when he was wounded. He was 17, 18, 18 yeah. turning, just turning 19, yeah. and um, he was only there for a month uh, when he was wounded. Yeah. He was delivering chocolate in, uh, to the, he was in the ambulance car and de de delivering chocolate and cigarettes to the troops. Um, and w after his wounding and his letters you mentioned to his family, there's sort of a gee whiz quality to them. You know, when he was going over to the front, he wrote his friends back in Kansas City, you know, I'm going to the front tomorrow. Uh, wow. Yeah. But that juvenile gee whiz quality seemed to belie the reality that something more happened to him with that wounding than, right. than we realized. And I think it does translate, as you're talking about, into mm -hmm. his artistic vision that... Yeah. Something happened to him yeah. with that out-of-body experience, and he traveled. I like the way you describe it to yeah. this other sphere. Right. Uh, he would revisit that 
in some of his yeah. stories about Nick Adams, where Nick mm -hmm. Adams in the story, um, Now I Lay Me, based on the old childhood prayer, which, heaven forbid, you should never tell your children, as I did my son, Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my right. soul to keep. Right. If I should die before I wake, right. <laughs> I pray the Lord my soul to take. I mean, what a terrifying thing for a child. Right. Right. And uh, Hemingway yes. would have Nick Adams yes. uh, write about that. And he, after his wounding, he was afraid to go to sleep because he feared um, he could die. His, mm -hmm. you know, his soul would be taken. And I think it plays into this, um, yeah. whatever journey he took mentally, I find it really fascinating. Yeah. And I think it is significant yeah. um, for him. You mentioned in your book mm -hmm. that Henry's second um, concussion with the right. skylight coming down on right. his head and that huge gash. And right. Archibald MacLeish uh, wrote about that later and how the blood was just literally gushing and Archibald MacLeish had to come to the apartment and right. drove him to the hospital. But you talk about how that almost seemed to trigger a freer flow yeah. of his yeah. artistic um, energy that yeah. led into his writing of Farewell to Arms. Yeah, um, it, it did. And, and McLeish talked about his giddy ramblings in the cab. You know, he was in a post-concussive state where he was confused and, and deliriform and, and just rambling. But he remembered what his blood tasted like, right, his own blood. It reminded him of being in the mud in Italy and what that blood tasted like. And, and that just unleashed this this force. What was a short story going nowhere just blossomed over, uh, you know, into farewell to arms. And I think he wrote to Scribner's uh, that uh, was it. Perk. I think he wrote to Perk. He said, uh, "My wife's going to see that I'm as bled as often as possible the way it's been going." You know, so the trauma really was somehow freeing. And uh, you know, who knows? I also wrote about the horseshoe-shaped scar that he wore around. You know, that's sort of kind of proud of it. That it was like. Every day was Ash Wednesday, that yeah. here's my outward symbol of inward change. Archibald Leash said it changed yeah. the configuration of his face forever after. Yeah. Um, well, the scar stayed with him. It yeah. did. It was, yeah. it was yeah. sewed up pretty primitively, right. apparently. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah. anyway, um, going back just to some other factors mm -hmm. that you talk about mm -hmm. uh, in your book that besides the concussions, right. um, the depression, I mean, that's kind of what many scholars have attributed to Hemingway, yeah. but you say he, he probably wasn't clinically depressed. Um. You know, he certainly had depressive symptoms and depressive episodes. His father was certainly depressed, you know, and father committed suicide, which we can talk about. Um, but, but, you know, a careful reading indicates that his, his depressive episodes weren't random. They were after... Incidents like when he had the car wreck in out west in Montana or something, and he just couldn't work. You know, there were there were these lulls after he finished a book, where he physically couldn't write or had run out of ideas, and he felt he he wasn't going to work. You know, that was sort of his always advice to Scott Fitzgerald, just you know, after the crack up, was don't pity yourself, go out and work. Work is your therapy. You know, this is what we're meant to do. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, they were more what we'd call situational depressions. Um, and I've had people argue with me and say, no, no, he was prone to chronic depression. Um, he certainly had the genetic risk factor for it. But I think that as he, in the last five years, certainly in, in his downward slide, yes, there was depression, but it was, again, through the awareness of the cognitive decline. You know, I think that the, the, the awareness that he couldn't work, that his mind, that his memory had been erased, that his mind was no longer, I think that's, again, more of a situational a depressive impulse from the situation rather than an endogenous. He's not the patient who comes to you, I don't know why I've been depressed my whole life. Yeah. You know, he's not like that. Yeah. And the suicides um, in terms yeah. of the family history, yeah. um, what do you make of all that? Right. The, you know, this talk about genetic loading. You know, the genetics of suicide are, are becoming clearer, but what's fascinating is that when we do find genetic markers for self destruction, they seem to be passed on independent of mental illness, which is very paradoxical. And certainly people who are depressed or prone to suicide. 15% of bipolar patients commit suicide. 5 to 10% of schizophrenia commit suicide. But the specific genetic marker can be passed without the trait for mental illness. So kind of a funny way to think about it, but that, that travels on its own path. Um, his father, of course, committed suicide with a Colt pistol carried by his father in the Civil War. Um, and his 
in the, I show the family photo and talk about how every him it was Hemingway and his dad and his mom and sisters and so forth, and even the two hearts unborn, right? The brother and the sister to come. Everyone in that photo committed suicide except two people. You know, amazing genetic loading. And his, um, uh, any rate, so um, we many people he knew committed suicide. Adriana, you know, his Italian muse, hung herself on her family mm -hmm. farm. Harry Crosby, I mean, Jules Pascan. I mean, they just the list of the people that die this way is. I think Pascan outdid everybody by, uh, I think he cut his wrists and wrote the name of his mistress in blood on the wall before he hung himself or something. You know, he, he got the prize for, for drama. Um, but yeah, the genetics um, are, are certainly there. And in fact, he wrote to his uh, future mother-in-law, I guess uh, Pauline's mother at the time, Pauline Pfeiffer, that he was delighted to have the Pfeiffer bloodline in his family to breed out some of the suicidal streak, yeah. you know. And the wonderful, sto not wonderful story, it's an interesting story uh, about Grandfather Hall, so his mother's father, uh, who was living with the young Clarence and Grace, his father and mother and so forth, he was, they were in his home. Um, but th Grandfather Hall was dying of Bright's disease, which is an old term for inflamed kidneys, very painful, uh, and he was gonna shoot himself, but Clarence Hemingway's father took the bullets out of the gun, and so he pulled the trigger, of course nothing happened. But uh, it's probably apocryphal, because Hemingway was just five years old, and he was writing this letter in his 40s. But the point is that he believed himself to be the descendant of suicidal men on both sides of the family. And that's why he predicted the suicide, rehearsed his suicide. Uh, he even would, for friends in Cuba, would show them what he called Harry Carey with a gun. And he would put the shotgun on the floor and uh, put his big toe in the trigger and put it in the roof of his mouth, and it would go click, and then he would grin. You know, why he needed to do that is a whole other book, right? But, but again, I think he believed that that was, that was within him. So yes, the genetics were there. But I think that um, when it comes to his suicide, people blame the ECT. Uh, they, they talk about the depression so forth. I think that the, the ECT itself, you know, we have a compromised brain. The shock therapy itself was a biological stressor on that brain that it could not handle, neither from a physiological standpoint yeah. or Describe psychological. Describe to the audience in case they don't yeah. know what, what um, happened in the last oh, right. year of Hemingway's life in terms of being taken to the Mayo right. Clinic and... Right. Um, yes, well, of course, he, he needed... He was very delusional, very paranoid, and was suicidal. He needed treatment. Uh, but he, and it was recommended to go to Menninger Clinic, but they knew he would never go into a hospital known for psychiatric care. So the excuse became your high blood pressure, go to Mayo Clinic, that will be the excuse. And, and there's evidence that was even hidden from him that he was taken there to be treated for blood pressure and suddenly he's on a locked psychiatric ward. Now, um, when you have psychosis and depression and you're suicidal in 1960 or 1961, you get shock therapy, you get ECT. Um, and it was, you know, the movies have sort of, we can talk about how the movies have treated the, that procedure. Um, but um, he received probably 10 to 15 treatments during the first round, but came home and was not much better. In fact, between admissions, uh, he went to, well, he had become suicidal again. Mary had caught him uh, basically writing a suicide note, got Dr. Saviors there, his family doctor. They got him to the uh, hospital there in Sun Valley, the Ketchum area. Uh, and he, they're waiting for a break in the weather to fly back to, to Mayo. Uh, so he, the, the day before, he's ready to go. They're uh, going to his house to gather some things, and he runs in and grabs a shotgun and, and gets shells in it before it's wrestled away from him by a nurse and another individual who is accompanying him, Don Anderson. Uh, so he's intensely suicidal. There's a story that on the, the second trip back that they stop at, at I guess, uh, it's a Rapid City, I think, or anyway, but they were stopping to refuel the plane, and he was rummaging around for a gun, or he was going to walk into the propeller of another plane. The, that's not true. That's been re one of those myths yeah. that's been repeated. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the uh, saviors who was there said this did not happen. But anyway, he goes in for another round of, of ECT, and he comes home, and within two days of being home, has, has shot himself. Uh, many people blame Mary because she left the keys to this gun case where it was clearly visible. Um, Rosemary Burwell thinks that Mary in her book, she talks about how she feel, felt that that was the way out for Mary, that she almost didn't plan it, but she allowed it to happen. Um, but at any rate, the, the shock therapy itself, again, you have a compromised brain, and he felt after that that he, he couldn't work, and psychologically he was ruined. I think the last piece of professional writing he did was that line about, the, about movable feasts. This book comes from the remise of my memory. 
I'm, on my heart, one of which doesn't exist, the other's been tampered with. Now, you could read it both ways. You know, my memory's gone, my mind is gone, and my heart doesn't exist, or my mind doesn't exist, my heart is long gone, or something like that. So typical Hemingway ambiguity, you can read him multiple ways. But he believed that he was, quote, out of business, you know. Uh, and so that, that's what led to the, the demise. But you're right, was he depressed? Sure, he was depressed, but again, it was propelled by the situation and the understanding that he, he, was, he was ruined, you know. Yeah, I mean, the whole role um, of memory mm -hmm. for a writer, yeah. particularly Hemingway, is huge. Right. And to feel that you're losing your memory, um, you've lost everything. Um, I pulled out this letter from, uh, I'm a part of the whole huge project now of publishing all of Hemingway's letters, where it's based at Penn State. And believe, we have, uh, we're coming out with a fourth volume in the fall. Yeah. And uh, believe it or not, there'll be 17 volumes of Hemingway letters, probably more Hemingway wow. letters than anyone ever wants to read. <laughs> but, um, uh, but it's been very exciting to uh, discover all these letters, many of them not published before, and see um, a new view of Hemingway actually emerging similar to what you're doing, kind of resurrecting him from some of the myths that right. have uh, developed around his very predominant persona. But in the early letters, um, as he's thinking about writing and heading off to Paris, uh, he writes to uh, one of his friends from the war, Bill Horn. This letter was written on July 17, 1923. And he's reminiscing about Michigan, the country where Hemingway grew up and the country that informed the In Our Time stories and the beautiful Nick Adams stories. And Hemingway writes this. We can't ever go back to old things or try and get the old kick out of something or find things the way we remembered them. We have them as we remember them, and they are very fine and wonderful, and we have to go on and have other things because the old things are nowhere except in our minds now. And as a writer, Hemingway knew that he had to step into memory. And when you read the Move of a Feast, where he talks about writing that the in our time stories, that mm -hmm. um, he's actually in the story and moving in it as he writes. And yeah. that's a tricky thing. You know, how do you step into memory? And for the artist, right. this was crucial. So when he's right. beginning to recognize that he's right. losing his memory, it's just absolutely tragic. It is, and the, the encephalopathy he had, the form of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the form of dementia he had from these blows, it didn't help his craft at all. In fact, you know, I write a lot about the posthumous works and the decline in the skill. Yeah. Um, and as you said beautifully, no one could imitate Hemingway like Hemingway, you know, and he had enough skill that he could create forgeries. But, but you know, the memories, the older held uh, memories stick around, even in more, you know, you can see a patient with dementia and say, what did you have for breakfast? They don't know. But say, what did you do in World War II? And they'll tell you, you know. So the older <laughs> held memories are, are more, and so that's why writing Movable Feast was a little bit easier for him, because he was going back to those well-ingrained things. Now, the skill, it took a lot of editing, right, and uh, to get the work we know. Um, and, and I think that you, you've taken issue with how the chapters have been arranged and you're very right to do that because he himself arranged them to get a Proustian effect. Imagine that, mm -hmm. you know, using Proust and Hemingway in the same sentence. That must horrify some people. <laughs> but he, he no, did that. No, it's and wonderful it's because great. Proust was all about memory and he talking was about, about and, and how do you step into memory. And, exactly. And this is it's very exactly. sensory that you, you yes. can't plan it or predict it. And exactly. he writes about dipping the madeleine into the tea and suddenly exactly. he's yeah. there with his grandfather at the farm. Exactly. And he said, that's, you know, so Hemingway and Proust are the, there, these there's, yeah, very There's alive. two sides of the same coin. The other wonderful phrase about them both I like is that they're, they're experts at the articulation of perception. Isn't that lovely? But you're absolutely right that the memory uh, was preserved better for the, the older days. But as far as, you know, the, the kind of skills he needed to do his craft, they, they were deteriorating. Um, you know, he was a, a working man, and, 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 you know, if you take something like Hills Like White Elephants, four beautiful words, we all know what it means, we've all written essays about it or whatever. That started as 83 words and several paragraphs, and he distilled it and distilled yeah. it. That's, po that's poetry, right? Yeah. To distill those concepts down to just those four words. 
the ability to do that was lost at, at some point. And that's why he would just stand at his desk shuffling papers in the last year and felt he could never finish the Paris book. He, we saw an exaggeration of some of the, the paranoia and the traits um, that he thought he'd be sued by all sorts of folks. I think that would explain why he so scapegoated Dos Passos, right, in, in farewell, I'm mean, sorry, in, in movable feet, because he was dead, unlike Murphy, yeah. you know, who he should have scapegoated, as you say. You know. And you've written beautifully about in um, uh, Garden of Eden, you know, it's about, you know, it's about writing. Yeah. And he's reliving the lost filet case of Paris and rewriting the stories from memory. The only two stories that survived were up in Michigan and My Old Man, and that was it. Mm -hmm. He had to reconstruct everything. And like Ezra Pound said, well, if the form was good, you'll be able to recreate it from memory. Mm -hmm. But if it wasn't any good, the story wasn't worth keeping in your head, you know. But you're right, in, in the Garden of Eden, we all get distracted by the sexual content. But it's a book about, it's about it's writing. A, absolutely it's about, about writing. writing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. The Garden of Eden is a book he he was working on last fifteen in the years. last um, Off and on the, years yeah. of his life, and um, he was trying to recapture the garden that a man has lost. Right, right. And crucial to that is not only the reconfiguring of all the personal stuff with right. the the woman, the two women, and the the lost manuscripts that get metaphorically right. presented in the Garden of Eden, where Catherine uh, burns. That. burns yeah his manuscripts, uh, David Byrne's manuscripts, and David Bourne, who wants only to write, um, has to recover those. It really parallels yeah. the lost manuscripts of Hemingway when Hadley right. left the suitcase right. on the train. Right. Think of that, right. to have all your work up to that point, or almost all your work, right. just disappear. disappear. Yeah. And most writers right. would right there kill themselves. Right. I mean, you're not going <laughs> right. to, um, right. how do you get that? ability to go back and face it down over. again. And Hemingway did, and I think it's what you described yeah. in this last year, is that he, yeah. the, the strength of determination mm -hmm. of his confronting, his awareness of his declining abilities, yeah. and yet he kept going at it and right. kept going at it and kept going at it. And um, right. there's something very triumphant in that. And in it's those true. last manuscripts, there's some really good stuff there. As you describe it well, yeah. it's all there, but it had to be kind of, someone else had to come along and pull out and pull out and pull out. Right. I, I talked with Tom Jenks, actually. He was the guy at Scribner's who edited um, The Garden of Eden, and many scholars kind of abandoned work with that manuscript because it was huge and very um, complicated. And finally, Tom Jenks, who was with Scribner's, um, took it on, and uh, he said to me, it was a bold edit, mm -hmm. yeah. but he didn't change a word that Hemingway had no. written. He, was, he just took and, you know, took yeah. out and took out and took out, and so it's, what's left there is, I think, quite extraordinary. Extraordinary. It is, it's funny how Catherine Bourne takes on the role of the critics, because she says, you're writing these silly stories about when you're a kid and about your father. You know, I mean, it's funny how she's just hypercritical, and I yeah. think he projected the critics onto her. Um, and you're right; I think it is the story of a man trying to to recapture the, that ability um, to write. And the the other side of that, you know, that when people asked Hemingway if he would see a therapist, he said, "Well, my typewriter is my therapist." Yeah. You know, now what he meant was that the act of working, you know, was was all I needed for my mental health. But what we know now is that it was the processing, you know, the the yeah, the content was much more valuable, and that's how he did his own therapy. If you think of um, Fathers and Sons, which is the, you know, a, a, probably the most joyous scene of his works, and that uh, it's it's got the stream of consciousness and, and the internal dialogue. It's got the overt sexuality. It's about a, a father and his son, and he's writing about his father. He's writing about he writes. It has more corrections and, and type overs than any other manuscript. It's right after the suicide of his father, yeah. and right after he's learned after the death of his first little honey, right, his little girlfriend when he's a teenager, Prudy Bolton, right, who's committed suicide, another suicide. So he's processing this, and I think that there's so much of Hemingway scholarship where we look backwards and say, aha, these are the people in Sun Also Rises that correlate with this part of his life. But I think the next phase is to look forward and say, okay, here's the man doing the, the work of therapy through this, this writing. Now, how does it inform the life going forward? Um, and, and now we have that, as it goes on, the, the other layer, you know, of the, the dementia going on. And he clearly was um, 
deeply troubled by his father's suicide. Right. And he right. said, always said he wasn't going to write about his father or people right. in Oak Park. Um, right. But he did write about his father, but it was really much of it after the suicide and that Fathers and Sons where he directly mm -hmm. um, goes into describing uh, his father's death right. and the way the undertaker had to really reconfigure his face right. uh, and mm -hmm. um, really feeling angry as conveyed in that story that his father betrayed him yeah. and betrayed others. And in the Garden yeah. of Eden, this core story there that David Bourne is working right. is about, about his father and trying to get at the heart of his father and the whole issue of betrayal. Yeah. And um, so that mm -hmm. the suicide thing is an underline. It's a huge it's dimension a huge there that yeah. hangs in all of Hemingway's art. I think when I teach yeah. Yeah. Hemingway to my students, they always tell me they, they feel a kind of underlying darkness and right. sadness that's just right. under the surface of right. his very minimalist um, prose, Absolutely. to be sure. Yeah, I mean, there's the thread that's always there. Even if a simple story, like a clean, well-lighted place. And the premise of the story is that an old man has attempted suicide. He's not been successful, and now his very presence yeah. is annoying people. <laughs> you yeah. know, and that's, that's the story in yeah. a nutshell. Yeah. You know, so you're right, it's a thread that just goes right through. Yeah. What about this idea, we talked about it mm -hmm. a bit, and people yeah. are often uh, intrigued with the idea of um, creativity and geniuses and the writers and artists who seem to be um, sometimes a little can I say crazy? Yeah, is that oh, sure, absolutely, acceptable yeah. today? Yeah, <laughs> then others yeah, yeah. Um, are, are functioning in a different dimension. There, right. you say in your book, and I love this um, line about the brain. The brain's complex design argues for our transcendental nature that there is in the creative individual maybe something more there. That. Right. Right, and you know, and, and that's that's a good place to start. And that when I talk about head injury and the axonal shearing and what happens to nerve cells after concussion, we're talking about hardware. We're uh -huh. not talking about the software, you know. Um, and I think our mistake is to assume that you know the Mozart is coming from the radio. Well, no, the radio is the tool whereby we hear the Mozart. The Mozart's coming from somewhere else. And I think that's that we, I think my profession has gotten so into the neurotransmitter and into the what Locke called you know the science of mind and matter. Uh, I'm sorry, matter in motion, that we've forgotten the, the science of the mind. And, we sort of, and I think it's good to remember that the, that transcendent nature of, of what we're talking about. Now, and, and I also will go on record saying that, that Hemingway did not have a monopoly on mental illness when it came to the lost generation. Um, you know, Joyce, of course, drank heavily. His daughter was schizophrenic, and that torment, his illness tormented her. Uh, just this, to watch a daughter suffer like that. Um, T.S. Eliot was so neurotic that his, you know, he couldn't pass a military exam because his heart rate was so high. But he married a, a girl that was thought to be psychotic. I don't, I, you know, I have a lot of feelings about Vivian Eliot. I think if you're a histrionic young lady in the 1920s and someone gives you bromide, you're going to hallucinate. <laughs> but, and that's sort of what they did then, like Evelyn Waugh hallucinated on bromide. Um, but uh, let's see, Zelda Fitzgerald, her psychosis is well known. Scott's drinking is well known. Ezra Pound spent his entire, pretty much his entire adult life as an untreated manic individual. Um, so um, poets are more prone to depression, sure. Bipolar folks are more prone to creativity. But the important point is that when they're in the grip of the illness, they're not working. They can't work. You know, the, um, there's a recent biography of Robert Lowell. I mean, here's a contemporary, yes. yeah. contemporary artist who was a wonderful poet, and certainly the bipolar illness informed his most striking and most critically acclaimed poetry, but he couldn't do it when he was acutely manic. When he was acutely manic, he was standing in the streets of New York trying to stop traffic, you know, and, and thought he was a reincarnation of the Holy Ghost. I mean, so. Yes, it may fuel the fires, but it's but you but acute illness does not is not conducive to work, and it's a heck of a price to pay. You know, I, I think we hear about the mentally ill artist, you know, because the stories are so dramatic, but I think there are many other artists who do wonderful work without that tragedy, you know, in their lives. Um, would we have Van Gogh paintings if he wasn't so tortured? I don't know. How would they look different? I don't know. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that gets um, to the yeah. level of speculation yeah. again, which we can mm. maybe go. Yeah. Well, we've talked about some comparisons of yeah. of different artists, and um, Andrew and I both uh, recognized our um, fascination mm -hmm. with the 
painter, William de Kooning, yeah. uh, who was doing abstract expressionist art in New York in the 1950s. Yeah. Right. And um, right. he, you write about him in your book. To, to right. Talk, uh, well, he's important. You're right. We both made that connection, not with the content of the work between Hemingway and, and de Kooning, because it's kind of impossible to do. But the fact that, you know, when you're looking at a de Kooning, you see this sort of cartoon woman. It's, it's sort of just a superficial distraction. Just like a lot of Hemingway's surface, if you read him on the surface, well, it's a fine story, but that's just the surface. What's really happening is underneath. And the layering and the complexity and the beauty of de Kooning is much like the layering and complexity and, and beauty of Hemingway. It's not there at first. It's not obvious at first. It's, in fact, de Kooning looks simple, but he, he's, he's not. But he was important to talk about because he's another artist who had a form of dementia. Um, and his dementia, he was a heavy smoker, and his dementia was the vascular type, and probably a, a bit of Alzheimer's, because when you do diagnose somebody with, a, with a vascular dementia, multiple strokes over time, small strokes usually, the, over 70% do have a component of Alzheimer's, fine. Um, but he still worked, right? And, and in, his, in the 1980s, he was cranking out the work, mm -hmm. and his work became even simpler. He used primary colors or ribbons of floating colors. Now, he, he was called a factory before Andy Warhol was even called a factory, you know. So what was amazing was that even though he could not recognize the people around him and, and uh, would have uh, volatility so for like any demented patient, they would put the palette in front of him and he would, he would do this incredible work. And he would only work with primary colors. And if they put other colors, he would push them aside, which is fascinating in the context of dementia because a demented patient will hang on to things they learned as like a very young child. They'll know their colors. They'll know, they'll be able to name their finger naming. Things you learn in kindergarten stay with you very, even when you're severe, severely demented. But the importance is that, that his craft could still, whatever he was doing, you know, the, the, the um, act of painting, the action painter, right? They were using the basal ganglia. This is learned memory. Uh, they're not using the cortical structures that have the dementia. So whatever his impulse was, as an abstract expressionist was still conveyed. Uh, whereas for Hemingway, he needed the cortical structures to do his craft. And, and I think that in the later, latter works, you see the archetypal impulses still trying to come through, trying mm -hmm. to break through, but he just can't, can't get, it, uh, get it down. But I thought it was an interesting parallel, the two types of yeah. artists and the two types of dimension, how it affected their works. Yeah, there are definitely um, parallels between the two in terms yeah. of their attempt to get to the interior. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I remember being absolutely intrigued by de Kooning's mm -hmm. women paintings, which you describe as cartoonish. Yeah. He would slash at these paintings and work at them for like a, yeah. over a year and kept, I don't know if you're familiar with those paintings, but they're very um, distorted and rugged and jagged and um, harsh colors. And I was intrigued when I first saw them as a young college student, yeah. realizing that to me what de Kooning was doing was not betraying women or demeaning women, but trying to get to the reality of the woman, the inside. And I thought it was really beautiful. And I think that's what Hemingway was about. He wanted to write the way the painters painted right. to, get, to find a way to get, as Picasso said, he painted what he could not see with his eyes. And how do you get into that interior right. world? And so the parallels right. between someone like de Kooning and Hemingway, um, I think, are yeah. very very interesting, and that's yeah. interesting what you're saying about de Kooning's ability to maybe pull it off in right. the end better than Hemingway right. was able to um, right. at the end. You're right. But yeah, and I think de Kooning was, was he a drinker too? I think he was a bit of a heavy drinker. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to defame him. <laughs> I know Jackson Pollock was, so. Uh, <laughs> right. Well, do, is there anything more you want to say definitively oh. that... Boy, you're so kind. Um, well, I think that it's, it's good to set the record straight. You know, I think that so many people have repeated the cliche that he was uh, bipolar and that explains everything, or he was a narcissist, that explains everything. And you and I talked a lot about the Hemingway persona. And, um, you know, and to me, it's, a, it's interesting from an autobiogra autobiographical standpoint, as it, working its way to the work and so forth. But, and it's interesting from a psychological standpoint. But I think that as... Um, as his dementia progressed, some of the hallmark symptoms of post-concussive syndrome developing a chronic traumatic encephalopathy are mood swings, volatility, irritability, you know, so that the, the worst aspects of the persona were almost solidified by this illness. 
Um, you know, I think uh, Gudjusek talks about the persona as, as um, he, he was like a spy out too long and kind of believed his own cover. But I think at some point he was psychologically and, and physiologically incapable of retreating from those behaviors and that persona. And uh, sadly, you know. Um, and I think the other, you know, a lot of people want to blame the alcohol for a lot. And I think it's worth noting that, um, as Scott Donaldson said, you know, he was a functional alcoholic for many, many years before the drinking took more of a toll. But the concussive injuries mean you tolerate alcohol less well. And I was, I was thinking Hemingway's like a Churchill when he said that I've taken more out of alcohol than alcohol's taken out of me. I think that's kind of classic for both of them, yeah. you know. Uh, but no, I think, we, I think we've got it right, knock on wood, you know. <laughs> and, the, thank, and your words have been very kind. The, the reception's been very, very kind from real Hemingway scholars yeah. and people who really know what they're talking about. It's been very yeah, nice. Hemingway scholars, I think, initially were a little skeptical. Oh, you know? weren't they? Well, <laughs> yeah, who is this guy? Who is, and another one of those, you know, <laughs> Hemingway's this, Hemingway's because that. Because there Hemingway's have great. been armchair psychologists who right. have um, right. analyzed Hemingway, and uh, there have been a lot of wacky uh, assessments. And yeah. some ideas that have been perpetuated, as you say, and become right. you know, ingrained in stone and right. really need to be challenged. So yeah. we really appreciate your yeah. showing the reality of his actual yeah. mental, physical condition and the way it yeah. affected his life, and then ultimately yeah. for us, his art. Um, right. Right. So. Um, I so thought kind. this was an interesting little poem, maybe I'll end with, sure. when you talk about yeah. the life that informs the art, yeah. the art forward. Right. Right. When Hemingway um, mm. killed himself, and it was in the newspapers, and initially Mary Hemingway <clears throat> tried to pretend that it was um, an accident, that Hemingway was, had been cleaning his gun, and of course nobody believed that. Right. But um, Archibald McLeish, who was a friend of... Hemingway's from Paris and was there when, when the skylight right, came down. Right. And, um, yeah. When he read in the newspapers about Hemingway's suicide and Mary's statement, um, in some inexplicable way and accident, she was quoted as saying, Archibald McLeish wrote this pithy little poem on Hemingway, and I think it kind of really summarizes really everything that you've been saying. Oh, not inexplicable. Death explains that kind of death, rewinds remembrance backward like a film track till the laughing man among the lilacs peeling the green stem waits for the gunshot where the play began, rewinds those Africas and Idaho's and Spain's to find the table at the Closerie de Lilas, sticky with syrup where the flash of joy flamed into blackness like that flash of steel. The gun between the teeth explains. The shattered mouth foretells the singing boy. Very powerful. That's very powerful stuff. Yeah. We'd like to open it up to you, um, our great audience, for questions and further discussion with us. It's hard to see. I've got this yes. blinding light here. Um, it's okay. Questions? Oh, and yeah, come, just come forward to yeah, the, sure. um, the mic. Sure. Okay. Go um, ahead. I just had two very brief questions uh, regarding um, athletes, football players, or soccer players that get concussions. Many times they're told to, uh, to sit out for about a week or so. Right. Um, and I was told that's because the, the blood vessels have, have uh, expanded, and if they get hit again, they could burst, I guess. Um, is there some truth to that? And, um, uh, and the other thing is on helmets. Some of the helmets are very expensive and very big. Um, mm -hmm. And yet, at the same time, I'm told that the helmet may protect the skull, but it won't protect the brain. So you can still get a concussion. So is that a, a false sense of security with these? Very nice helmets. Yeah, you, you bring up a great point because you know, the brain is, is floating in a fluid sac. And, and of course, the, the, you, at some point, it does get, you know, with, the, with, the severe, with the, these kinds of hits, it gets sloshed around and hits the bony structures, gets contusions and so forth. Um, so you're right that the, the better helmets, as you see, they have that sort of cut out frontal area where it basically 
lessens the impact, but at some point, uh, there's not much you can do with some of these hits. And you're absolutely right about what you're describing in your first question is second impact syndrome, because there are cases of people that might even have a mild concussion sent back in a game. It's only, in the literature, only about 44 cases, but a second concussion within minutes to hours, sometimes even days after a first concussion can, in this, in this situation, disrupt the, the, the blood vessels of the brain and their ability to, to have their integrity and, and the fluid will seep out of them and the brain, brain swelling is very rapid and there have been deaths and those who have not died have had permanent injury. So you're right, the resting of the player is um, to prevent second impact syndrome. Now we live in an age where the, the, to say a concussion protocol, well it's, it's very different from team to team, sport to sport, you know, sideline to sideline. It really doesn't have one singular meaning um, we have locally, we have a, a set of, uh, of things we do. And, and you know, the, the first question is do they, how long do they rest? Should they rest for a certain period of time or not? And there are certain agents that you can take to lessen the damage. And we based ours on, on the military's protocol with some, some additional factors. So those are great questions. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Alex Cardoni, Hartford, Connecticut. Yes. Um, I'm a psychopharmacologist at the Institute of Living. Yeah. And uh, I've been following Hemingway and his medical issues since 1988. Wow. Uh, and uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for a wonderful uh, oh, review uh, of this, uh, this topic. Thank it's you. very difficult. My, my interest is focused on Hemingway's drug use mm -hmm. uh, uh, while he was alive, obviously. Right. Uh, the fact that he took drugs like Ritalin mm -hmm. and uh, uh, other psychoactive drugs, barbiturates, uh, mm -hmm. probably to control his moods Mm -hmm. bring himself down when he was too high, lift right. himself up when he was too low. Right. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, his admission to Mayo and the way they handled him at Mayo, uh, right. I have uh, great concern about. Right. The fact that they didn't try available medications at the time. Right. I know in your book you mentioned there were two medications available. There were probably more than two uh, psychotropics available during right. that time. Right. The MAO inhibitors were available, tricyclic antidepressants, and uh, Thorazine and Melaril, right. and thyroidazine, right. which is a low-level antipsychotic drug, which is sometimes used in uh, mild, quote, mild uh, schizophrenia. Right. Uh, it seems to me they should have given him a trial of medication first, early mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. uh, before ECT, uh, to right. see what would work. Uh, in 1961, lithium was available as an investigational drug in this mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I have a feeling that he should have been given a trial of lithium as well. Right. You bring up a lot of great points. And, and you're right. Through the um, 50s, uh, he was known to take um, Ritalin. He went to his Cuban doctor, said, I, I fall asleep after lunch. He didn't ask him how much he was drinking during lunch. He said, I can't work. <laughs> but he gave him Ritalin. For a period, but it wasn't, and he also took secanol at times at night, and it was the secanol and the alcohol together that would make him fall asleep in front of guests and so forth. Reserpine was used for his blood pressure, which unfortunately depletes serotonin and makes people more depressed. Mm -hmm. So at Mayo, they certainly, they did take away the reserpine, um, but very common antihypertensive, but it also makes people depressed who are more prone to depression like he would have been. He took testosterone in, in shot form, and he took high doses of vitamin A because he thought it would be good for his eyesight, high doses of vitamin E because it thought it would help his libido. But from what I could gather, nothing was ever that consistent. You know, it was sporadic as far as the use of those compounds. Um, you're right, there was amitriptyline and I guess imipramine at the time. So there were two tricyclic antidepressants. I guess there was Nardil as well. And of course, um, th thyroidazine, right? So, but, but at the same time, you know, 1960, um, uh, I, I didn't, of course, no one, I didn't talk to Howard Rome. I talked to one of his colleagues and kind of asked him, the same thing. Uh, and he said that, um, and I talked to a medical student who was there at the time. Uh, their thinking was that this is such an acute situation, uh, let's go ahead and do the ECT. They also um, were mindful, you know, the side effects with tricyclic antidepressants are short term memory deficits, decreased libido, weight gain, sluggishness. So they, they kind of were weighing that out. And, and really, the, the, the psychopharmacology, we, we really hadn't broken away from insulin coma you know, uh, shock therapy. In fact, in fact, poor old Zelda Fitzgerald, I mean, she not only had shock therapy, she had insulin coma. Her doctor was a very unusual practitioner who would inject the spinal fluid of his patients with placental blood or with honey. I mean, just bizarre sorts of things. It's, it's a wonder they survived, you know. Um, just a, uh, a postscript. Mary Hemingway visited the Institute of Living in June oh. 
of 1961 wow. to look at the campus. Uh, she wanted him transferred from Mayo. Uh, yeah. And of course, he, he would never go. Uh, right. Against his will, you can't uh, transport patients across state lines. And secondly, uh, he wanted to be admitted uh, under an alias again, right. which uh, they would not do at the IOL. Right. So, uh, Great question. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you. Well, yeah. First of all, I'd like to thank the panel for speaking yes. so clearly on rather complex matters. Thank you. Um, one of the issues that was not mentioned, I think, or at least not extensively in the discussion, had to do with the alleged attempt on the part of Hemingway's mother to present him as a female when mm -hmm. he was very young. I'm curious, even if we accept the notion that it's the concu concussive injuries that really underlies much mm -hmm. in Hemingway all the way through and perhaps accounts for his inability to, to write later, yeah. if there is somehow a very, very powerful strain that is not describable in physical terms as you've done so, but has a lot to do with that condition uh, of the mother's relationship with Hemingway. My sense of Hemingway, mm -hmm. and I'm eager to hear a reaction, yeah. is that Hemingway was a man who needed to be a human being without restraint. Mm -hmm. He did physical exercise that was excessive. Mm -hmm. uh, he married four times. He drank right. to excess. He took right. drugs to excess. Uh, he somehow seemed to need to tempt to risk death in order to find out what was the truth about death in mm -hmm. order for him to grasp beyond the norms mm -hmm. that normal life provided. And I'm curious if you could somehow assess this strain of macho, unrestrained behavior in relation to the concussive course of, uh, of, of his life in determining what really made Hemingway Hemingway ultimately as an artist. Yeah, that you bring up the, the twinning of uh, Marceline, sister Marceline and, and Ernest as a young age, they both dressed, his mother twinned them and dressed them the same and so forth. And that was sort of a quaint Victorian holdover to have the little boys in gowns for a period of time. Um, and the twinning went both ways. Unfortunately, it was Marceline who suffered worse because her hair got cropped off as a teenager, looked like a boy's, and you know she made she held her back so that he and her, she and Ernest could be in the same grade. You know, so I think both uh, genders suffered from it. Um, but I, I think he had no real recollection of that happened at such a young age. But I think a lot of people have made a lot of psychological hay over the fact that hey, you have a, this macho overcompensation for being twinned as a girl, and certainly gender bending and gender switches show up a lot in his short stories. Um, little girls saying, I'm your sister, but I'm a boy too, kind of thing, and, and little in um, Last Good Country that shows up very prominently. And of course, uh, Catherine Bourne, uh, you know. So um, yeah, I think he processed that. Um, yeah, the, but I think that to getting more to your point of the, the daredevil, the macho overcompensation, I think that how it, how it relates to the chronic concussions is I think that the, the concussive injuries tend to, like I said, to solidify the worst aspects of the persona, which would be the bluster and the braggadocio and the loquaciousness and the irritability. And, and, the, the, and I think that's where it kind of got to, had its organic solidification. Um, but you're right, there's a lot of people who've written about that and they've, they've noticed the same thing you have. And, and he did hate his mother. He absolutely hated her. And uh, like his friend Buck Lanham said, he, he, a lot of people say they hate their mother, but I think Hemingway's the only person who really hated his mother. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Could I just ask a small thing in relation to what you just said? Would right. you also say that his attacks on other people, particularly friends, yeah. seems yeah. to fall also within this unrestrained ethos that characterizes his life and behavior? I think it's, it's all under that umbrella. And I think that you also, you know, there's a part of him that is the adolescent boy that was di displeasing mom and dad, 
there's a part of it that never changed, you know, and I think that the last marriage to Mary Hemingway, they played these, this very pathological ballet. She was, he was the naughty, contrite little boy. He misbehaved again, and she would scold him and maternally, and it was, it was the same relationship he she, had with yeah. his mother, and they acted it out beautifully. Um, for the rest of their lives, very, yeah, very complex. Yeah, you talk in your book about a kind yeah. of regression into yes. childlike yeah. behavior. Do you think that yeah. that is a result of the... Of the injuries, the, yeah, I think so as a form thank of... Thank you so much. Thank you, great questions, yeah, complex, yeah. Hey. In all of the pictures we've seen of Hemingway, he's either a young man or a very old man. Right. And I was just wondering if there's anything about concussions, yeah. mental illness, it just ages the hell out of you. Well, it does. It actually does. And the drinking didn't help, you know. And, and I think as a young man, he certainly had the Hollywood looks. But, you know, by the late 40s, he was really letting himself go. But in the latter photos, you can see the neurological damage. You, certainly the scar is still there. But you see the ptosis, the drooping of the, of the eyelid on the left side, which is a sign of, of, of dementia or brain injury and so forth. And you see the slight extropia of the eyes where they're not quite as, as focused in, in the same point. So that, that's what we call soft neurological signs. So I think you're right. I think the hard living, the repeated blows, the hard drinking, I think you know, being blown up a few times, that took its toll, absolutely. Yeah. Andrew, uh, as yet I haven't read your book. Perhaps yeah. you covered it. But at any rate, yeah. uh, did you get uh, into the uh, uh, research about the uh, apparent uh, hemochromidosis uh, yeah. in the bloodline? This is a great question. That, that article came out in 1990. It was such an original contribution because somebody was really thinking outside the box. They said, look, he had all the symptoms of hemochromatosis, which is a hereditary illness. So they argue, this author, she argued that his father had it as well. It leads to skin pigmentation. It, it's a, basically a, a disease of iron storage. So it will, the iron will abnormally build up in the liver and the skin and so forth, but it has multiple brain manifestations to look like depression, mood swings, dementia. So it was a lovely explanation. So, um, I, so I did look into that. And there's this notation from his internist at the Mayo Clinic where he says, I just don't think a liver biopsy is worth, I think you might have, it's a possibility, but I don't think a liver biopsy is worth the exploration because liver biopsies are dangerous now. They were dangerous in 1960. But I was able to learn from that med student that iron levels were part of the routine blood work. So as the reason his doctor said let's not bother with a liver biopsy is because in the presence of a normal iron liver, iron level, a liver biopsy would just be too, the chances of having that illness in the presence of a normal iron level are, are nil. So it was a great idea, but it turned out to be a, a dead end. But it, but it, it, it was, a, it, it sort of took hold too. And, and a lot, you'll read articles, aha, he had this, you know, but I was just fortunate enough to meet somebody who said, who. Um, who remembered, you know. And I guess if my patient were Hemingway, I would remember everything about that chart, <laughs> yeah. too, you know. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again for a great uh, conversation. So um, this is less academic, probably, than some of the other questions. But uh, there's been a fairly recent movie, Hemingway in Cuba, or Papa Hemingway in Cuba. Uh, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Is that a, a movie that... Um, you know, for the general public, says anything about Hemingway or um, how I that have goes. Not seen and then that. I have one other question. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you talked about the genetics of suicide in the family. Right. Have there been other suicides after his in his in his you know children or other yeah. relatives too? Yeah, the granddaughter Margot, of course, is mm -hmm. the the famous one. His his son Gregory had the most. He truly did have bipolar and had the most tortured life, received multiple ECT treatments, and sadly died in a jail cell in Miami, you know, of a heart arrhythmia because uh, they were unaware that he needed heart medication um, when he was arrested. So he, he had the most tortured and saddest life. You knew him. Yeah. So, uh, um, but yes, and Margo, of course, is the, the famous. I've not seen the movie um, in Cuba, and that's always been sort of a... Um, a, a, a did you, have you seen that? It's been I haven't seen that particular. I tend to kind of resist mm -hmm. seeing some of these movies because it yeah. worries my husband because I get so upset and <laughs> storm out of the theater. Because the reality is, yeah. and it's what we've been talking about here, you've got this artist with this incredible um, persona, the myth of Hemingway, Papa Hemingway and the macho guy. And the reality is, is he was very complex and actually very tender, very sensitive. And movies that have tried to capture Hemingway, Fitzgerald, any of those characters, 
they're larger than life, and they, they come across as kind of just you know, silly looking characters. Um, the only mo movie that I think's really done it well actually is a movie that was intended as a parody, and it was um, Woody Allen's oh, Midnight in Paris, so, yeah. which I actually liked. Yeah. And, um, and they were kind of um, caricatures of these writers. But just a further note on that, um, in, in respect to not being able to capture the reality of, of Hemingway, and it's something that he fought too. He was trapped in that persona. Uh, I was a consultant on a series that was planned for American Playhouse several years back. It was going to be on Hemingway and the whole um, Lost Generation group is centered around Ger Gerald and Sarah Murphy at Villa America. And Sarah and Gerald Murphy's daughter, Honoria, loved Hemingway. She said he was the most tender man she had ever met. And there was a um, scene they were trying to film that Honoria told the story of Hemingway taking her out fishing and on, on the lake, in Saranac Lake, where her brother Patrick had been taken for his tuberculosis. And she, Anoya catches a fish, and it's sort of the stereotypical woman, ah, now what, and the fish is flopping around in the boat, still in line, and Henry said, well, now daughter, you know, you have to take it off the line, and she could, so he said, I'll show you. And he took the fish in his big hand, and took it off the hook. And then he got out his fishing knife. And he slit open the fish and flayed it open. And Honoria told me, she said, in the, uh, in the morning sun on the lake, the insides of that fish glistened like jewels. Because what Hemingway did then was he says, now daughter, I want you to see this fish. And he pointed out and named every part of the interior of the fish. To me, that's a wonderful metaphor for Hemingway's art, that you yeah. have to get inside. But the, the reality is, is how do you photograph that? They tried to photograph that scene about 10 times. And what do you get? Hemingway, the magical guy with a young girl, taking his knife out and slitting a fish open in front of her, and the blood, and the, you know, it's so. You can't, you can't bring him to film. So I tend to resist, but I have had colleagues who said that the Cuban movie was not very good. No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. But it gives you some good scenes from Cuba. Yeah. It does. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just a clarification. In your book, you mentioned that uh, Carol Hemingway committed suicide. Yeah. In 1999, my wife and I met with Carol Hemingway. Wow in western Massachusetts. She lived in Shelburne Falls with uh, her husband had, had passed away. Yeah. She was 88. Yeah. Now, could you clarify that statement that she committed suicide? Uh, let's see. I'll have to get back to you. <laughs> could you yeah. have been thinking of, of Marceline? Because there's been yeah. some speculation that Marceline. Yeah, that was, I think suicide. that was a, a typo that's corrected in the next printing. Oh. Is that, yeah, of the sisters got reversed. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. You've been a marvelous oh, audience. It was just a delight for both of us. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for coming. And I hope you'll all rush out and buy Andrew's oh. book and have him sign it. It's, a, it's an extraordinary book. Uh, and I say that as a Hemingway scholar who's a tough judge. It's really uh, new and really very well done. He's done his research in the Hemingway scholarly world, um, and he certainly is, has his vast knowledge as a yeah. uh, doctor. So, so kind. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.